Uh, we have some wonderful speakers who are uh, going to be speaking about some uh, very important issues and ideas in our community and in our world. Uh, we certainly would like um, uh, you to, to be the center of that. Uh, but firstly, um, we would like to, uh, on behalf of the community and on behalf of the organizers, I would like to welcome uh, Nadine Farah, uh, our uh, distinguished uh, speaker tonight and, and uh, guest of honor. From all of us, please welcome to Ottawa. I, I think this city has, uh, has a, uh, a special place for Nuruddin because he's been here several times. And if you think of the size and the location of, uh, of Ottawa, at the end of the corner, we're in a corner of the world, and I think to have Nuruddin visit the city several times is, is a real honor, and uh, we're very pleased uh, to have you. Uh, Somali Women's uh, Circle Network, um, we have known them now for several years for their amazing community gatherings and uh, awareness uh, and information to the community. So uh, thank you again for putting this together. And uh, from that, I'd like to invite Fozia Ali uh, to talk uh, about, the, about the evening. So welcome, everybody. Um, it's a great honor to be able to open this conference on behalf of the Somali Women's Circle Network in collaboration with Carleton's Institute of African Studies and the Department of English and Literature. So thank you all for taking the time out of this cold and long week to engage with us in a dialogue of gender equality and our campaign of I Matter. My name is Fozia Ali, but my friends know me as Sia. I'm a student here at Carleton University studying criminology and psychology. Um, to those who are new to our organization, like I said, we're known as the Somali Women's Circle Network. I can say I've watched the circle go from a creative idea amongst my aunts to an amazing organization that works to create awareness and dialogue among our community. Four years ago, Dr. Il Lalana, Naheem Ali, Ambassador Eddie Lalana, Lucky Ali, and Sahir Abdi would have discussions and debates in our living room for months when they realized that everybody should be part of their discussion. They decided they needed to create a link to all Somali women around the world and give a platform for every woman's voice. They wanted to create change within our community, and after weeks of deliberation and collaboration, the Somali Women's Circle Network was formed. As an organization, we stand for empowering of the Somali women in society in order to end the suffering of the Somali people. As a young youth of the first generation, it was fascinating to me to hear my moms and aunts speak of the change that they wanted to see. They've always said that we have a strong voice. People just need to hear it. And when they do, change will happen. One, two, three, four, five. I whisper counting the sounds of my footsteps as I walk down the street late at night. One, two, Three, I stop whispering so I can focus more on making sure that the only sound of feet hitting the pavement are my own. I look over my shoulder afraid of what I might find. I look over my shoulder afraid of seeing a shadow other than mine, but all I see are the bright straight lights and a second shadow next to mine. I begin to subconsciously quicken my steps trying to run without catching the attention of this person I'm praying is not male. My heart beats so hard I'm breaking and hear my fears and use them against me and I cannot risk this because all the odds are already in his favor. So I slow down because faster steps are louder. I, re I build up enough courage to look over my shoulder once again, and then I realize that the second shadow is mine as well. I breathe in but not out because I still haven't reached my teeth, so I listen more carefully just to make sure I'm alone. Yes, I conclude I am. I'm unsure if this is a blessing or a curse, so once again, I look over my shoulder afraid of what I might find. I have been looking over my shoulder for five years since the day I held my best friend tight as she told me she was raped. Since the day I started questioning if all people were really human, because how could anyone with any humanity ever commit such a felony? One day I brought my feelings to a friend and she laughed and said, But Roy, you dress so modestly, there's no need to worry. Oh, the sour taste of irony. And all I can think is, so are you saying that all rape victims just provocatively? Because she was seven. She was seven when her head had shattered because she was already living through hell. So I asked myself why. Why? Because we live in a society that chooses to blame the victim when it's easier than finding a solution to the bigger problem. And you may say, no, we're living in the 21st century, though we are educated, we are logical, we have morals. 
So tell me then, why is it that for every article about a rape victim, you'll find her age, her level of intoxication, her career and her education, and possibly even an outfit description, as if any one of those things give another person the right to take ownership over her body? We live in a society where women are ashamed of their own bodies, so only 54% of rape victims will ever approach authorities, but as soon as a laptop is stolen, people speak up almost immediately, as if owning an electronic is more important than owning ourselves. I have been fighting for custody over my body since the day the midwife announced female. So forgive me for sounding so bitter. When we got a note that looked like a very simple note from Fozia about um, having uh, this event, collaborating on this, um, we didn't have more choice than to uh, put heads together. So I'm wearing two caps tonight on behalf of Carlton um, as um, faculty in the Institute of African Studies and um, the Department of English, which also have uh, joined in supporting this event. Um, so by wearing those two caps, I think our uh, guest writer and the very distinguished uh, it's our home in two departments in Carlton, in African Studies and in English, um, two areas where um, he struggles in addition to creative writing in his very rich career. Um, trying to introduce the guest writer within so short a time, especially when we have um, if some other parts, it's um, like trying to hold you out for a while because um, his credentials are enormous. Um, but I want to point out that I met Nurida Ampara for the second time yesterday. And I went in that we had met, you know, um, in 2000, uh, when uh, uh, Professor Chino Achebe, may so rest in peace, you know, marked his 70th birthday. And I have since had to write a tribute in which um, I have a little surprise embedded in it for Nurida and that would also and I would um, show him better. But there are a lot of coincidences about his life. You know, um, his life reads like fiction itself in many ways. Um, his first book began, you know, the short the story about a nomad girl who runs away uh, rather than getting involved in an arranged marriage. That sense of exile has dogged his life because um, events in his homeland has made him um, go into a certain post-exile, and he is in every sense a global man, um, has lived in about 11 countries, holds about three international passports, and continues to live in various countries um, that we might be asking where he's going to be next, and he's at home in all of his nations, but more importantly, he carries with him in all that he does, um, that spirit, that African spirit, that human spirit that allows him to continue to tell stories wherever he is. He's a natural storyteller. And I do not want to mention, I try not to mention in association with very distinguished writers from the post-colonial world that they have been Nobel Prize nominees because sometimes it appears like something of an insult, as if uh, winning such an exalted prize is a way of actually affirming their distinction. Uh, but it has to also acknowledge that uh, Professor has been nominated um, for the Nobel Prize, uh, but he has also won so many other important prizes. He is at home uh, wherever he goes around the world, and in his soul is our continent, Africa. Um, I can't do more because I um, would I um, give the ads to him today. Uh, I also want to, on behalf of the Institute of African Studies and the Department of English, welcome you all to this event. And, and since uh, UK welcomed us in his native language, I'd like to welcome you all in Somali. So do I. Um, you know, first and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge this beautiful space that we're in because uh, Naima and I were, were students not too long ago, and I'm sure that lecture halls didn't look this beautiful. <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, I'd also like to uh, take this opportunity to, to, to recognize the organizers of this event, uh, the Somali Women's uh, Circle Network. Uh, the Institute of African Studies and the Department of English at Carleton University. Uh, thank you all for giving us the opportunity to continue this very important and timely dialogue. Um, I also want, you know, never, in a, never like any other time in our history, um, I think we're at a real uh, crossroads uh, with the issue of, of sexual violence and, and rape and violence against women. Over the last month and couple of months, 
we've seen a public discourse about rape and the dialogue go viral on social media. So two quick uh, Twitter hashtags that I'd like to quickly highlight is a hashtag why I stayed and why I left. Uh, it's a social media public uh, campaign that was debated as a result of the Ray Rice incident. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Ray Rice, he's an NFL football player who punched his wife uh, violently um, in an elevator. Uh, and that created a debate online uh, which was huge. So for the first time you have millions of, of people, not just women, talking about this issue of why they stayed and why they left. Um, the other incident, uh, the other hashtag that's gone viral recently has been hashtag been raped, never reported. Um, again, this is a result of the whole Giango Meshi uh, scandal that I will not get into today, but I'm sure that we're all broiled in uh, you know, one way or the other. So again, we're seeing millions of women chive in in this public debate about being sexually assaulted and why they didn't report it. So not reporting is, is a social pheno phenomenon that most people don't understand. And it's troubling to hear that the amount of women who don't report being sexually assaulted, but it's equally important to hear and inspiring to hear that there's a public discourse that's been opened up about this now. So so many people, we have so many people speaking about this. And just to paint a local picture in here in Ottawa, as Mohammed was saying, I work for an organization called Crime Prevention Ottawa, so I thought it was only fitting to dig up some of the stats that we have. Uh, and, and it's quite alarming. The number one call that police respond to here in Ottawa is sexual assault and partner assault. So, and yet you hear such uh, you know, huge volumes of money pumped into things like fighting drugs, but the number one call volume is sexual assault and, 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 and sexual violence. So in 2000... Um, it's a great honor to be here tonight. Uh, to speak to you in this uh, very personal and um, emotional topic, um, violence against women. As I frequently travel to Somalia and neighboring countries which we have to pass by, people usually ask violence against women or the violence in Somalia. Um, I think there is, if you type women and violence in Somalia even in combination in Google, let alone doing any big research, you'll find tons and tons of articles. Um, from one of the recent ones, 2012-2013, to uh, the UNDB and UN Women, uh, an article a titled Violence in the Lives of Girls and Women in Somalia. It just gives you the statistics of all the rape and everything happened from all the different regions in Somalia. Um, but I would like to take this in a different take. For me, what I believe is violence against women is actually um, man's issue. It's not women's issue. Um, and the reason I said that is it's very obvious, but at the same time, I want you to take a trip with me uh, going back to historically <coughs> Somali men and how they treated women, and the time is very short, so I've been told to keep it short, or actually even making shorter than my 15 minutes. I would like to look at this in two components. One is cultural perspective, and one is in the Islamic perspective. Um, in cultural perspective, if you go back before the war, um, and I'm going to be switching back and forth in Somali, so you have to bear with me. رجل سومالي ذو حلوية قال إن جرت ولا جرب استعجا. Actually نينك رجع وحلو قيمين شري نينك ولا شيء يرير كيس يحاس كيس يكل دافع بروتكت جري. Some of the famous things in Somali men used to take a pride in Somali men was protecting and providing for their families. It was kind of shame if you even look at the. Uh, the historical perspective in Somalia for a woman to earn and work and provide for the family because that was something that our men did and um, was good at it. Now, of course, every culture has ups and downs and when I say that, I'm talking about matter of uh, the general perspective of the majority of Somali men. Um, there was a simple balance that a family in a household that 
Somali women were not irrelevant or submitted, submissive or homemakers. They still had, were part of the economy, they were still part of the decision making, um, they still sometimes get the last word of whatever decisions they want, but at the same time the protectors and the providers of the family were men. Um, Good evening ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here in Ottawa. Many people, many of my friends in Toronto continue asking me why it is I come back here all the time. <laughs> it's probably because you allow me to speak. <laughs> and I thank you very much. Made friends over the years and it's always very welcome. But I couldn't uh, find my way back to my hotel if I chose, which is something I should do something about. In other words, until only coming for half a day and then going back. Uh, the subject interests me a great deal, and it only does interests. Not only does it interest me, this subject violence against women, but I have written about it quite so often that I think much of my work is about violence against women, or responses to it. And it's probably something to do with this that my daughter, Abian, at the age of 11, wrote a story which won her the best prize for a young writer in South Africa. She was 11 years of age, and she wrote a fantastic story, which was published in South Africa. The entrance to this particular competition, there were 35,000 people who entered for this prize, and at the age of 11 and a half, she won the story, she won the prize, with the story that I'll tell you now. And then I'll tell you also my own reaction to the, to the story, because I had a personal reaction to the story as a father. The story is about a man whom a child calls uncle. A man, older man, comes to the house, rings the doorbell, a little, little girl, age 13, 14, allows him to come in because she calls him, hello uncle, how are you? And then he says, hello uncle. Hello so and so, the, la the little girl's name. He allows, she allows, you know, the little girl allows this man into the house. But she says as she's walking into the living room, she says, you know, mum and dad are not here. And then he says, when are they coming back? Oh, they're coming back this evening. I'm, I, and are you the only one? Yes, I'm the only one. And then that man, whom she called the uncle, not, it's not a story, but it's a fiction, rapes the little girl, the 13-year-old. When she won the prize, when she first wrote it, and then obviously entered the prize without my seeing it. Afterwards, I said to her, where did this come from? <laughs> because I became a father at that time. I mean, I really and truly wanted to know where did it come from. Now, it may have come either from a story that she had heard, because she assured me nothing of the kind happened to her, it may also have come from the fact that my former wife, her mother that is, ten years earlier had written a book called Domestic Violence Among the West Indies in Britain. Now that could have been one of the connections. The other connection could have been any of my books. 
So if somebody is young, growing up in a household in which a subject comes up quite often, the warnings are sounded quite often, one becomes aware, one can think about this, one can tell a story about it. Now, the story that I wrote many, many years ago, which I have told many times, and if you don't mind it, I'll tell it again. At the age of nine, when I was a letter writer for people who did not know how to read and write, and this is, this is 60 years ago, a man came to me to ask me to write a letter on his behalf because he didn't know how to write. And he was, you know, paying for the service of writing the letter for me. And then he said to me that his wife had gone away and although she promised she would return in a week, in a month probably. She chose not to return. She stayed on and on with her parents, refusing to come back. And then a the man said to me, and I am nine years away, he said to me, write it down. I want you to write to this woman and to tell her that if she does not come back within 30 days, I'm going to come to the town where you are living and I'll break every bone and drag you all the way, all the way, from Belaguene, where she had taken refuge. <coughs> and upon, upon being told this, the punishment that, we, that she would meet if she didn't come back, I wrote, if you do not come back in 90 days, you may consider yourself divorced. <laughs> now, I cannot tell you apart from being mischievous, and I'm being honest, I cannot tell you apart from being mischievous at the time, and also apart from knowing that women continue, were continually beaten, and I'm, I can say it now because they're both dead. Yeah, and may God bless them, my parents. I can, tell you, I can tell you that my father quite often did not hesitate to use violence against anyone, not only against my mother, but against boys, against the girls, against everyone. So because violence was present in every sense of the term, and there was seldom any communication, you know, loving communication between the children and the parents. And so, being raised in that sort of a household, I feared for this woman's life. And I said, more or less, the message was, <coughs> don't come back. <laughs> and she did not come back. And she took the 90 days, as 90 days, and then stayed on, went to the Qadi of the town, had herself divorced, because officially, uh, if you have such a letter written in Arabic, because I wrote a letter in Arabic, it became carte blanche. She took it to the judge, and the judge divorced, uh, you know, declared her divorced, upon which she found herself a husband who was kinder to her, who hasn't beaten her up. And then he turns up after six months and says, what happened? I sent you a letter that if she didn't come back, I was going to break up and drive. And then she, he, was, he learned the fact that she was already married to somebody else. And when he questioned how sh could she be married to two men, the letter was brought as evidence. You see? The letter that I wrote was evidence, and because it was written in Arabic, and I come from a society in which Arabic is not. Well, many people don't speak Arabic. Uh, it is respected. Now that is the story 
that I wrote at the age of nine. I'm now 69, 60 years ago. And it means that if something is forever present, it will be present in, in, in an everyday sense, if something is present in an everyday sense. It will also be present in the lives of people, in the stories that people tell. Now, it's quite shameful, I think, as a Somali, to say how disturbing it is that we as Somalis, men or women, do not take the, the issue of rape quite seriously. I have forgotten to thank uh, my hosts who have kindly invited me here. And I'm also, I spoke yesterday evening with a few members of the Somali Women's Circle Network. And I'm also delighted to note that there are men amongst the Somali Women's Circle Network. Uh, and I also believe, and I hope my trust is worthy in investing in some of the people who are members of this group. But I'm hoping that the men will not take over, because when men <laughs> come into a circle of women, uh, they, they sometimes take over and dictate the mission and uh, give direction to the movement. And I'm, this is a warning to Sharmarke. <laughs> Well, first of all, it is necessary. It is necessary for men to be on board for anything that concerns any concept that has something to do with the betterment of the entire society. It's not. It doesn't only affect women. Rape doesn't affect only women, but it affects everyone. And for that reason, it is necessary that there is the notable presence of men participating in that particular thing. In the same way as I would have also liked many, many years ago for men to participate also in the crime, the barbaric, barbarous behavior, the barbaric behavior, the Somali barbaric behavior, or female circumcision, and so on and so forth. Because we must be carrying these, this society forward to a better condition, much better than uh, the situation is at the moment. I was most highly impressed with Rua and Dean's poem, a very beautiful poem, well thought, well considered, well conceived, and to remember I look over my shoulder. In other words, there is no safety. There is no safety other than in numbers. There is no safety other than in lit areas of the world. There is no safety. There is fear. There is, you know, and, and f for one to live daily with this fear must be something. And it takes, it takes courage for somebody to come out. There is a uh, uh, a Somali poet who lives in England, whose name is uh, Warsan Shire, is one of the best. Well, she's written one of the several of the best poems about violence against women. And I wish the women here would invite Warsan Shire so that she can share some of those experiences, some of those poems. Uh, she lives in in London. Uh, and she was a poet laureate, you know, young poet laureate, recently appointed. Now, in which a woman is raped, and when she is raped, when she is raped, marriage is legitimized. Marriage is legitimized. How is it legitimized? A woman is raped, the family of the woman, the girl, will come together, they will negotiate, they will negotiate with the man who raped her 
and occasionally even pay him money to marry the woman. Instead of taking him to court, instead of doing terrible things to him too, the family asks the criminal, you know, appeases the criminal by asking him to marry. And then he marries, and very often he marries her for three weeks, four weeks, so that the child is not born out of wedlock, illegitimate, as it is called. And once the halal, the, birth, the child is halal, then they say, you can divorce her. The victim. And can you imagine such a man going into a, into a bedroom with a woman? You can't imagine affectionate relationship between the I can't imagine it. I mean, it's a horror story. It's a daily story that happens on a daily basis, on a yearly basis, every time, every time. And all the other talk of uh, Somalia and you know, reconciliation, national reconciliation, there has never been any talk. We learn a good deal. Our boys were killed. But no one ever talks about our women who were raped. Where is the justice in that? Behaving this way? If we're legitimate, if we're behaving in this barbaric way. But we are, I'm glad to say now, we are improving a little. Improving a little in the sense that we have a society of women here in Ottawa and in a, a number of other places who are working harder and harder so that lives of those other people who have survived humiliation and rape and other things may, uh, may, may survive. It's, it's, it's a very, very difficult, uh, very difficult thing. It's something that's worth thinking about. It's something of which we must be ashamed that we haven't picked it up many, many years ago. And I remember when I published my first novel about 44 years ago, many of you in this hall were not even thought of, let alone born. <coughs> the people who were at that time living in Mogadishu thought that I was a betrayer. They, I was described as a traitor because I had written about two things. One, female circumcision and how barbaric it is. We're talking of 1970, 1968, I wrote the novel. And then we also talked about a woman, Ebla, who in his idiotic wisdom, her grandfather gives her off in marriage to a man his age and accepts a couple of candles in it you know, as part exchange. And then when she runs away in search of safety, her cousin sells her to a man who rapes her on the first night and becomes the husband. Now this is continuously the stories of many, many Somali women. Many Somali women. So when you combine female circumcision with continuous rape and then the impossibility of producing healthy children later in life. Uh, I am absolutely amazed and I'm full of admiration for Somali women who have remained strong despite the horrors that have been visited on them. And I've written about them, and I remember interviewing many, many men and women uh, for a book of mine called Yesterday, Tomorrow. And the only people who were worthy, whose stories were worthy being repeated, were the stories of the women. Because Somali men were, are, and will remain useless for the rest of their lives. <laughs> talking and talking about politics and nothing else but politics. Instead of talking, instead of talking about the things that matter to their women, to their children, to their daughters, 
we're always talking about, we have our umbrella up when it rains in Mogadishu without caring what happens next door to us. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much. Je m'appelle Monique Lorty, and I'm very pleased to be with you. It's an honor, to, and it's a, a great honor and privilege also to talk to you about a dear friend of mine, one of uh, Nuruddin's dearest sister. Um, I met with Basra. In, 19, in the autumn of 1979, she was at the time, she was a student at the uh, Eastern Michigan University studying nutrition. Basra was a very, uh, she was born Somali. She was a very, very proud Somali woman, as you know them, strong, proud. And I remember and everybody who's known Basra remembers her from the time you met that strong woman. You never forgot her. Um, you would always remember her smile, her nice, tender approach. But she was, when she wanted something and when she meant something, she would tell you exactly what she thought, and um, she was very proud of her culture. I remember when she came to visit my family in Montreal at that time, um, she said she wanted to be with my family at Christmas. Being a Muslim, being a Somali woman, she had never experienced uh, Christmas, and she knew that in my family, we celebrated Christmas as a family gathering, and we are nine children, and at that time, father and mother were there. And it was so cold, minus 38 on that winter, <laughs> Christmas night. And she said, Monique, do you think your father and mother would be very offended if I'm wearing my sweater and heavy trousers instead of my guntino. I said, no, my father and mother want you to survive in the cold, so <laughs> forget the guntino and wear, wear something warm. So this is how Basra was. My children have uh, known them. My daughter, for my daughter, she was a role model. Um, when she first met with Basra, she was uh, seven years old. She's always talked about Basra every time she had uh, an opportunity to exchange uh, letters or views with her, she would do. And um, the, um, the, the night when I uh, told her what had happened to Basra, she really you know, said, I, I can't imagine. You hear of people being killed somewhere, and when it touches you and your friends and your family, uh, you cannot imagine what's happened. I will tell you uh, what she has done and why we have decided, together with other friends and with Nuruddin, to launch this uh, fund. Everywhere she worked, she walked. Everywhere she went, when she made friends, they never forgot. Basra. Um, or sharing that, that personal story with us and introducing Basra to, to all of us. Um, I want to thank the Somali Women Circle Network um, for combining these two, two agenda items tonight, and it, it's incredible when, when something works, it just works, and it wasn't planned for a long time, but when I came to uh, the leadership of the Somali Women's Circle Network, and I, and I said, I, I need help, We're, we want to launch a fund, um, they immediately said, well, there's 16 days, and we can, we can combine it, and there was some 
incredible synergies that, that uh, came together. And it's moments like that that uh, I am proud of, of the uh, Oro Somali community and, and proud of, of the energy of, of some of the uh, Somali women in, in this town. So it's, it's my, really it's humbling um, and honor to, to first of all be part of the Basra Farah Fund. And I want to say thank you to Nuruddin, uh, a friend of mine, for including me in this. I have not had the, 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 the pleasure of knowing Basra, but I have known of Basra's work. We don't have too many professional Somali women nutritionists. So you know of, of, of people like Basra, uh, but I haven't had uh, the opportunity to meet her. But I met Nuruddin uh, several years ago, and I have heard over the years how close Nuruddin was to, to Basra and his family. And I remember January 18, January uh, 17 was a Friday, and I traveled to Toronto. And I was in Toronto, and it was one of Nuruddin's nephews in Minneapolis who texted me, assuming I have seen the news that Auntie Basra was killed. And I could not believe the text I was reading. So I called him. I, I was in a, in a community function in Toronto, in a hotel. And I excused myself from the people I was with because I, it, didn't, it didn't register. I, I, it, was, it was not something that one could easily believe. So I called him and I said, what happened, Ahmed? It was Ahmed Abdul that, that texted me. And he said, I just wanted to, I thought you read the news, you heard that Auntie Basra is dead. And I was like, oh, I, I didn't hear. So it's, it's one of those things that I still can vividly remember, the room of the hotel and, and, and the session I was in. And I remember thinking about how and when to get in touch with Nuruddin and, and how to talk to him. And then Monique and I drove to the funeral um, to Detroit, and it was then that Nuruddin said, Basra's, Basra has, has had a quite an amazing, uh, not only career, but impact on communities globally and locally. And I want to keep that legacy alive in, in, in one way or the other. And it was during the funeral that uh, we've talked on and off with other friends to see how we can best come up with something. And, and it was the legacy, that, that, that humanity, that, that impact that touching people in a positive way when they are in crisis, when they are in difficulty, that she has devoted her life, that was worth keeping that legacy and continuing that. So in a very humble way, we thought maybe we will come up with something that can continue. So we came up with the Basra Farah Fund, and we have since went back and forth whether to register it here in Canada or the U.S., we, we ended up deciding there were more members of the board in the U.S. We decided to, and she was an American citizen, to register it in the U.S. But it's a global world, and it doesn't matter where that location address is, as long as there is a website and there is a, a community around the globe that is going to support this. So I brought some, some flyers here. That, so if, if you don't mind sharing with people, there's a website information and, and everything else. So the purpose, as I said, was keeping the legacy alive, but also the purpose was to focus. And as Nuruddin talked about, everything Somali tends to gravitate towards politics. So we consciously said, let's, let's not even consider that. But let's talk about how we can do some small steps in touching the lives of those who are vulnerable, whether they are in Somalia or whether they are here or whether they are uh, somewhere else. 
dealing with women and children, mother's health, children's health, in conflict zones, in peaceful places, wherever they are, women are, are marginalized. So we came up with the Basra Farah Fund. It's registered. It's, uh, it has a website that, that works. It's, uh, thank you. The overall vision of the Basra Farah Fund, as you would see in the flyer, is to mobilize resources, whatever we can mobilize, to serve the vulnerable communities. Focusing, as I said, and starting maybe with Somalis, not necessarily just in Somalia, but Somalis everywhere else, but it's women and children. So vulnerable, marginalized um, women and children, whomever they are. Contributing to somewhat, in, in a small incremental steps, alleviating child malnutrition and mother's health. Trying to raise awareness, and I'm glad that, that the Somali uh, Women's Circle Network and the campaign and the time, and tomorrow being the 25th uh, of the Polytechnique massacre, it's coming together, and I'm, I'm glad that, that all these things are coming <coughs> together and aligned. See how we can contribute to that raising of awareness, and eventually also adding to that body of knowledge and literature that, that Nuruddin has created about women and women's stories and, and women's experiences of the challenges uh, that they face. And so in a, in a concrete way, as we go ahead and now, this is the launch and next steps would be trying to get some resources. We've already started speaking to, and this is not just going to be in Somalia, as I said, community in Minneapolis, but also community in Somaliland, and communities in Puntula, and communities in Mogadishu, and communities in Kismayo, in the Juba, and communities in the northeastern province of, of Kenya, which is a Somali inhabited territory, and communities in Region 5 of Ethiopia, which is a Somali inhabited territory. And we're trying to sort of see how we can, in a small way, start to contribute towards maternal and child health. And we're hoping that this launch is going to also reach out and, and touch all of you so that you can also, in a small way, start to take those steps with us and support us in any way you can in honoring Basrafar and also continuing her legacy. Um, the Carlton University, uh, the Institute of African Studies, as well as the Department of English at Carlton University. Um, I also would like to thank uh, all of our speakers, uh, starting with Shamaki Abdullahi, Naima um, Ali, uh, and of course uh, Lua Ali, who actually had to leave. She has another event to attend, so she was kind enough to come in for at least half an hour just to come and perform that amazing, amazing poetry. Um, I also want to thank our master of ceremony, um, Sultan, for reading me today. could not have been possible, uh, really, without uh, his efforts. Uh, I also would like to thank all of you, really, for taking the time to come. We you know it's December, it's cool, um, it's Friday night, but uh, thank you so much for coming out. Um, and just uh, want to take a, a moment uh, just for us to really remember uh, Zahra Abdullah and her two sons who were just killed this past uh, weekend, really, it's, it's a tragedy. And because, you know, those of you that are uh, Muslims that are here, we want to take the time to really read Fatiha for them and pray for them, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them, you know, Jannati Kawarabi. But can I just have a moment, please? Ahmed um, Kure uh, from Hiram and I, that was kind enough to come, being a, the busiest man uh, that I know. Um, <laughs> Um, I also would like to thank our videographer, Abdi Kareem Osman, who has been very kind, even he's busy, he's got family, and he still came tonight. So thank you, Abdi Kareem. <laughs> and lastly, um, you know, you heard a lot about the circle. I, uh, I am one of the board members of the circle. I joined past July, 
So I, I celebrate a year and a half with the circle. Very proud to be um, to be a member of this amazing organization. Uh, you heard about what uh, you know. Uh, my good friend Rosie talked about the history. Uh, not even touched about some of the objectives why the circle exists. But what I like to leave you with tonight is um, well, why why do we do this event? You know, we all know it's an awareness, yes, but really it's is to. Uh, inspire young women, uh, young and old, any woman really, and of course men, to really talk about this issue of violence against women. You know, it, it's, we all know it, it exists. You know, it's not uh, something that's new to all of us. But talking about it, you don't you don't hear that a lot. So tonight we want to encourage everybody that this is something that we should all talk about it. And uh, you know, but yeah, and I said uh, earlier uh, that enough is enough. We need to stand up. So again, thank you all so much. Elliot, Elmer, Cynthia, and Harry Watson.